So welcome to our second and final, yes, I'm good, thank you. Our final panel, our panel number two uh, before our student panels. Uh, revolutionary art, healing and the politics of change. Um, and this uh, panel was inspired by the fact that art in black life has always played an intrinsic and important, significant role in black life in um, marking the survival and thriving and flourishing of black folk. Um, drawing from the radical tradition, um, I think of Nina Simone who said that the duty of the artist is to reflect the times. And if we know anything about Nina Simone, she aligned herself with the black liberation struggle um, in a way that um, disrupted and reimagined and self-defined and self-authorized uh, the genius of black people through her art, right? Um, and so we're looking at various genres of art and the ways in which um, art is used to uh, reflect, represent, and mark um, in totality uh, black life from multi through multiple modalities and ways, um, from art within social movement to art within spirituality and religion, through art that registers um, in within the political. Uh, and so our, each one of our speakers will speak to uh, dimensions and these multiple facets and define their own work and their own um, impetus and motivations for the art that, that they do. So it is my honor and, and distinct pleasure to facilitate this panel and to welcome uh, each of our panelists. So first we'll have um, Arik. Um, and bear with me while I, okay. Arik Fleming, our very own Arik Fleming, I should say. Um, Arik is an MDiv uh, two, I always wanna say three. MDiv three, because we don't really want you to graduate, <laughs> right? Arik Fleming Jr. is a young, innovative servant of God with a multifaceted purpose in ministry. He is a preacher of the gospel, a scholar of religion and training, and a musical recording artist. He is a native of Decatur, Georgia, and a graduate of Arabia Mountain High School in Lithonia, Georgia. As a freshman at Morehouse College, Arik accepted a calling into ministry and previously served as youth pastor at the Mount Carmel Baptist Church under the leadership of his godfather, Reverend Tim, Timothy Fleming Sr. After graduating Morehouse with a Bachelor's of Arts, Arik received ordination and uh, has, will be matriculating Harvard Divinity School um, this May. He currently serves the Memorial Church here at Harvard University as the first Master of Divinity Seminarian for the Black Student Ministries at Harvard. He is also the former Vice President of the Harvard Graduate Student Council. And alongside of his, um, uh, his, his, his preaching ministry, he also has been blessed with multiple musical opportunities. And I'm sure we can hear a bit more about that um, in our conversation. But without further ado, um, Arik Fleming Jr., thank you. OK. Hello, everyone. Um, as stated earlier, my name is Arik. Um, I guess how I can start. Mm. I come from a rich preaching tradition. And it's not one that particularly orients itself toward activism against oppression, but activism against daily struggles of the everyday mother, single mother, in church congregations, 
bringing her kids to service every Sunday, finding ways to feed them with no money. Um, that mother is who I was raised to speak to. But while I was taught to speak to this mother, I was also told simultaneously that I could not sing to her because my voice was not adequate enough to serve her in ministry in that way. And I found recently liberation from um, a favorite of mine, Sam Cooke, who was raised in a very similar context, um, who actually decided to go by a different name on his first release because he didn't want the interrogation of his church family to um, kind of dismantle the power he was bringing to popular music. Uh, my passion after discovering um, my preaching calling and also after wrestling with the musical gift that I have, my passion has been to reach a broader audience, but I have been limited because I was trained with those training wheels at home that I could not sing. And so I have been actively, every time I sing, every time I step up to sing, I'm actively vocalizing my struggle and I'm actively fighting against the people who told me I could not sing. Um, I think this is valuable because when you understand how your art reflects who you are and what you're called to do, you're able to kind of encompass all of the power that is within you. And I think that is what I've been struggling with the most, um, trying to find out what my voice is, who I'm called to speak to, who I am called to sing to, because I know now that when I open my mouth to sing, somebody's chains are literally going to fall off. Mm -hmm. And it was, I wouldn't say the ignorance of, of the people back home, it was their fear that I was going to fall um, into a secularist kind of um, perspective of doing ministry. And I, I, I think the way I, I, I conceive of ministry is so far beyond the walls of the church so far beyond the walls of academia, so far beyond a wall, period. I think um, at any moment, at any time, anybody's ready to hear a song, and those, that song should be able to lift burdens off of people. And I think that that goes into um, current resistance movements. I think that goes into resistance in church. I think that goes into social movements, whatever you want to um, call it, and however you want to address activism, I think raising songs is always the way, and I can, we can talk a lot about this, but the songs will be the way that lead the people into activism. And so as long as my mouth is shut, we won't get there. But the moment I realize that I'm called to sing, to lead the people into liberation, I have, I have done my duty. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, our next panelist is uh, Kendra Hicks. Um, Kendra Hicks is a nonprofit executive, community organizer, mother, and installation artist from Eggleston Square, um, a neighborhood of Boston. Her work lives at the intersection of the practical and the imaginative. The Estuary Projects is t a 10-part installation series about remembering the apocalypse and reimagining the new world. The installation's aim is to memorialize the lives of 11 black women who were murdered in Roxbury and Dorchester in 1979. And I have the distinct pleasure of calling Kendra not only a sister, but also a comrade as one of my, one of the co-leaders, um, lead organizers of Black Lives Matter Boston. So welcome, look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Carlene. 
Uh, I'm assuming I'm using this mic, but I think the voice is projecting <laughs> pretty well. Um, thank you for that introduction. So like Carlene mentioned, my, my work is really at the intersection of what I call the practical and the imaginative. Um, and so I like to, part of the purpose of the estuary projects is to remember what I'm considering an apocalypse. And so I'm really, it's an invitation for us to look at what the end of the world looks like for us. Um, I think that in, the, in this historical moment, it feels like all things are falling apart. Um, but the, the Estuary Projects is calling on us to remember that actually we've been here before, that our people have survived the end of the world, that our people have survived the Middle Passage, and that we will continue um, to survive and continue to build the world that we need. And so in that way, the Estuary Projects is a remembering project, but it's also a reimagining project. Um, the good people at the Design Studio for Social Intervention, they use a framing that we're living in a toxic atmosphere and that what we're trying to create is counter atmospheres. Um, and so I look at counter atmospheres as being uh, alternative social systems that are not rooted in white supremacy. And so when I think about um, revolutionary art, I think about how does art disrupt our current reality? How does art disrupt our distractions, right? Um, Toni Morrison said that the, the, one of the functions of racism is to keep us busy and to keep us distracted and to keep us with our head down, always reactive and responsive, reactive and responsive. Um, and I don't think that that gives us a lot of space to imagine. Uh, I think that we spend a lot of time um, organizing and fighting and resisting and not enough time dreaming and manifesting, really, the world that we want to see. And so my hope is that the estuary projects, but also just artistic practice in general, serves as a disruptor of that, that it serves as a calling to take our heads down from under the ground and put it up and really focus on visioning and building the world that we want to create. I think that it's a, there's a very capitalist orientation that we have that in order to build something new, something else needs to be destroyed. Um, and so we're constantly, particularly in social movements, looking to, to break down and tear down and, and dismantle the thing that's already there, um, when in reality we can just build right on top of it. Um, I know that we'll have a lot of questions and so maybe I can talk a little bit more then, but that's what I have for now. Thank you. Next, we have Michael Brandon McCormick. Um, Michael Brandon McCormick is a PhD, uh, assistant professor and director of undergraduate studies in um, comparative humanities, program in religious studies at the University of Louisville. He earned his PhD in religion, homiletics, and liturgics, black religion and cultural studies in 2013 at Vanderbilt University where he was a fellow in the program in theology and practice. <clears throat> sorry, I don't have my glasses, y'all, sorry. <laughs> His research explores the intersections between black religion, popular culture, black preachers, public theological discourse, and the moral panic surrounding black youth culture. He teaches courses in African American religion, religions of the African diaspora, and religion and hip hop culture. His work has been published in Black Theology, an international journal, the Journal of Africana Religions, Practical Matters, a journal of practical theology and religious practices and religions, and as book chapters in a number of edited volumes. Most recently, he was a faculty fellow of the Commonwealth Center for of the Humanities and Society at the University of Louisville, where he has researched a project that centered on black joy as resistance and religious praxis. And uh, as I said in the introduction this morning, Michael Brandon McCormick joined us for our very first inaugural conference. And it is our delight to have you back again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it's good to be here. Um, it's late in the evening, so 
I, I gather up my energy again, and, and but I'm very excited to be with these fellow panelists. Um, I was coming to Harvard, so I wrote I wrote a, a paper. <laughs> I wrote um, because it's Harvard, um, and so I, I apologize if I'm out of order of the more extemporaneous mood um, of this panel. But bear with me; um, I will try to, to to read it with 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 uh, energy and, and emphasis, right, uh, and joy, because indeed that is what I want to talk about: black joy. Um, uh, so I, I, I think of myself not so much as an artist proper, although I think all of us are artists in our own right. Um, I, I was trained in homiletics and liturgics, and so the arts of ministry are, 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 are important to my own thinking and practice, but also black religion and cultural studies, so how religion is functioning within black popular culture is important to me uh, as well, and how the two sometimes mix and sometimes don't. So black joy as an artistic and affective praxis of resistance and resilience and religion for me. Um, so here goes. In her work, The Black Interior, African-American poet and literary scholar Elizabeth Alexander describes the ways that, quote, corporeal images of terror suggest that experience can be taken into the body via witnessing and recorded as knowledge. These corporeal images or spectacles of black pain include Historical examples such as the whipping of enslaved Africans, public lynching and vigilante violence, as well as more contemporary instances of police brutality and the state-sponsored killing of black bodies. For Alexander, black bodies carry a collective cultural memory of violence on the flesh, a memory that instructs African Americans concerning not only the parameters in which their bodies move, but also informs the subject formation of what she calls the black interior. Elizabeth Alexander's work bears witness to the affective experiences of public spectacles of black pain and death endlessly circulated in mass and social media among spectators who feel themselves implicated in such violence. While she is not a theorist of affect, Alexander calls attention to what affect theorists often describe as how power or forces or currents flow through bodies, as well as how such forces flow through the consumption of various forms of media. I find that Alexander's argument concerning how the witnessing of violent and deadly enactments of power affects those bodies implicated and intended to be disciplined by the simultaneous spectacularization and normalization of such dis terroristic displays dovetails with what with critical questions raised in a recent AAR panel I participated in on the felt life of vulnerability. If indeed vulnerability is felt in bodies, as the effects of power, and such power affects racialized bodies in distinctive ways, that I'm particularly interested in exploring how vulnerability is felt in the flesh of black bodies as well as the black interior. Affect theorists might ask more directly, how does vulnerability feel? Indeed, this returns us with a difference to Du Bois's perennial question, how does it feel to be a problem? Thus, Alexander's work serves as a critical point of departure for exploring a series of questions at the intersections of affect, emotion, and religion in the context of contemporary struggles for black life and liberation. What and how do black bodies know through a possible epistemology of trauma as a result of the constant viewing of public spectacles of black pain and death? Do such embodied ways of knowing suggest an irreducibly affective dimension to those who have been rendered racialized, gendered, or sexualized others, such as a turn to affect theory becomes necessary to more fully account for black embodied experiences? Uh, and I'll, I'll cut across field here some. But these questions open to more pressing question, set of questions that motivate this particular paper, and which is in the midst of such violence and trauma, what do we make about the possibility or praxis of joy and black joy in particular? Is such a black joy, if such a black joy is possible, under what conditions is it sustainable? What is the significance of the intentional cultivation of emotions such as joy? What work does black joy do? What is the role of artists and other culture workers in expressing and holding space for black joy? And of course, within, this con within the context of this particular gathering, is there anything religious or spiritual about recent constructions of black joy? Or better, how does black joy as articulated and practiced by those who are often considered be beyond the boundaries of black religion, or at least precariously and problematically positioned within those boundaries, challenge us to rethink the religious and its significance as a mode of both resistance and resilience. But before attending to black joy, however, it's necessary to further examine the vulnerability and trauma of black bodies against which conceptions of black joy are often articulated. 
So let us return to Alexander with an eye toward affects of displays of power upon black bodies made to feel vulnerable under more contemporary regimes of white supremacy. As Alexander traces the legacy of state-sanctioned violence against African Americans, she calls attention to how witnessing, watching, or awareness of such forces threatens the threaten, that threaten black lives lead to feelings of vulnerability that affect how black bodies comport ourselves and move in and through the world. She is also attentive to the circumscription of the boundaries in which black bodies move. Moreover, her work calls attention to the existential effect upon black subject formation. Alexander argues, black bodies in pain for public consumption has been Ameri an American national spectacle for centuries. White men have been the primary stagers and consumers of the historical spectacles I have mentioned, but in one way or another, black people have been looking too forging a traumatized collective historical memory that is re-invoked, I believe, at contemporary sites of conflict. In an essay entitled, Can You Be Black and Look at This? Reading the Rodney King videos, Alexander calls attention to African-American responses to viewing video footage of Rodney King's beating by Los Angeles police in 1992. Says Alexander, the language employed by the speaker is a corporeal one, heard and then experienced in his nervous system as a pain that went from the top of my head to the tip of my toes. Alexander observes the entire body and its synapses make this response. Alexander's attention to the effects of violent power upon black bodies is deeply connected to her interest in how subsequent feelings of vulnerability affect the subject formation of the black interior and its expression of related emotions. In an article for New York Magazine, writer Ashley Weatherford describes more recent examples of these contemporary sites of conflict, corroborating Alexander's critical reflections on affect, emotion, and the vulnerability of black body. Weatherford's article can be described in terms of what literary scholar Carla F. C. Holloway has called the African-American mourning story, or a narrative marked by a collective memories of African-Americans' particular vulnerability, not only to pain and suffering, but also to premature, untimely, senseless, tragic, and violent and often murderous death. According to Weatherford, quote, I can't tell you how many times I watched a black man on, die on a two by four inch phone screen in 2016. The number is equal to the times I witnessed a white man escape punishment for his crime. It stunk, it hurt like hell, it made me feel broken from within. Weatherford's account of the effects of repetitious witnessing of black death is described as a kind of fracturing of wholeness that is felt within the black interior, but with implications for the body. Conversely, Damon Young, editor for the online magazine Very Smart Brothers, begins with his body's own refusal to be further subjected to trauma. However, on Young's account, the body's self-protective mechanisms are apparently not enough to shield the black interior for, from feelings of vulnerability described as an experience of tearing and searing that calls to mind a realization of Du Bois' subjunctive possibility of the tearing asunder of the souls of black folk now bereft of the dogged strength necessary to maintain wholeness against the white supremacist forces working on against and through black bodies. In an essay entitled Laquan McDonald and the Slow Death of Black Joy. What a title, right? Young wrote, and I'm thinking about watching the recently released video of Laquan McDonald's execution. And I'm thinking about why I just don't have the stomach to watch it tonight or tomorrow night or any night. And I'm thinking convinced actually I'll never watch it. And I'm thinking about what Laquan McDonald could have possibly been thinking about in the last moments of his life. And this is how shit like this tears your joy away, how it rips it apart, how it burns it. This is the invisible psychic cost of existing in America while black. And though Young offers this richly descriptive account of, a uh, tragic account of the slow death of black joy, he doesn't exactly focus on the significance of joy or the implications of its demise for the kind of existentia Africana, to borrow uh, from philosopher Lewis Gordon, that he describes. Of course, Harvard professor philosopher, and philosopher of religion Cornel West has consistently invoked these concerns in his work, particularly in his more public pedagogical performances, even if not in a substantive or sustained manner in his writings, though one could certainly imagine that a concern with black joy is implied in his earliest treatment of black nihilism in America and race matters. 
But since at least the mid-1990s, West has argued that there has been an erosion of black joy among a younger generation of African Americans. For West, this is in part because of the increasingly vicious effects of global capitalism that undermine the strength and integrity of black communities, institutions, including religious, and networks of care, as well as the commodification and individualization of various modes of pleasure that corrupt what he sees as the more substantive and communal experiences of joy. The, this, this waning of black joy among younger African Americans is a tra tragic loss for West, since black joy has not only been instrumental in the physical and psychic survival of African American communities, but also in empowering the weary back into collective struggle. Indeed, for West, black joy is inextricably linked to what he sees as a set of non-market values, such as love, care, kindness, service, solidarity, and the struggle for justice, that he argues are values that provide the possibility of bringing people together. West laments that under the weight of white supremacist backlash to black progress, the worsening economic and material conditions in which vulnerable black bodies are forced to live, and the alienation of young people from prophetic black religious communities and practices, whether forced or chosen, such a subversive joy has been eroding among those younger African Americans who have come of age in the post-civil rights era. And to be sure, Damon Young's testimony of how shit like this tears your joy away, how it rips it apart, how it burns, it seems to corroborate West's account. And yet I want to pay attention to how the seemingly non or anti-religious Black Lives Matter movement, with all of its expressions of rage and defiance and perhaps even a turn to expressions of Afro-pessimism, has also given renewed expression to Black joy as a mode of resistance in struggles for Black liberation. Recently, a younger generation of black intellectuals, activists, and artists, to be sure, has begun to reclaim and reimagine black joy as a vital contribution to the struggle against the constant trauma inflicted upon black people. For instance, in 2015, black Latinx poet and writer Cleaver Cruz began the Black Joy Project on his Instagram page. Reflecting on the origins of this project and the context of his own feelings of mounting depression, Cruz remembers, quote, I thought about how present I was to black death and pain through my organizing work with various activist collectives in New York City and the ways I felt bombarded on a daily basis, end quote. Cruz would go on to describe his experiences in ways consistent with Alexander's analysis of black embodied affectivity. He insists, I wanted to relieve myself of the pain that surfaces after watching too many news accounts of fatal shootings of law enforcement ending the lives of black people in the US or the numbing feeling that chills the heart after another young black person is killed for similar reasons in Brazil. This led Cruz to an alternative praxis of resistance captured by a simple but powerful call to action. He said, let's bombard the internet with joy. This is resistance too. Trauma is real, mi gente. Let's tr trigger love as much as the pain as we share important topics that we all need to be up on. And a more expansive articulation of black joy is resistance. Cruz insists it is resistance to choose to laugh and dance and sing and smile and all the ways that joy manifests itself in the face of white supremacy, in the face of systems, structures, and societies that tell us that we are not worthy of living, let alone enjoying it. And so while Cruz's digital curation of black joy was initially conceived as a 30-day self-healing challenge, testimonial feedback from organizers and everyday folks convinced him that this notion of black joy was bigger than his own personal healing, that the Black Joy Project was indeed a call to community transformation. So indeed, the sentiments expressed in Cruz's The Black Joy Project have resonated and become pervasive in black popular culture and among artists and activists involved in the movement for black lives. From DJs Amber Phillips and Jasmine Walker's The Black Joy Mixtape, to curators Nick Alder, Lauren Ash, and DJ Ray Chardonnay's creation of Party Noir as an intersectional space for all black joy, to performance artists marked by Muti Joseph's choreographed dance and spoken word piece, Black Joy and the Hour of chaos, um, and more recently to Oakland's Black Second Annual just last weekend, Black Joy Parade, as well as Chamel Bell Street Dance Activism out in the Bay Area. Black cultural workers have been intentional about the deployment of black arts and culture 
as a means to conjure a kind of sustaining and indeed subversive joy in the face of state-sponsored violence. Thus, I'm interested in the ways that these and other black cultural workers have creatively reimagined and deployed black joy as an affective, potentially effective, and a potentially effective means of resistance. And such, I am concerned with how these performances of black joy seek to represent black lives in ways that not only resist trauma and despair, but also encourage collective identification around notions of black resiliency, self-care, healing, and thriving. I got a lot more in this paper to say, but I've already said a lot and I'm reading a paper and we're being more extemporaneous. So let me yield the rest of this time um, and, and, and hopefully in conversation, we can get at some more of these dynamics about how artists are deploying um, and holding space for what they see as black joy as an intentional kind of praxis, not to deny black uh, pain and other forms of organizing and struggle, but as a way of uh, buoying up black, uh, black spirits to do this kind of work. Thank you. Thank you so much. And our final uh, panelist is uh, Steve Nunez. Um, after growing up in the Port City, Wilmington, North Carolina, Steve Nunes, Nunez enlisted in the Army, where he earned a Green Beret and spent five years as a Special Forces Weapons Office Sergeant. After an honorable discharge, Steve began contracting for the State Department as personal security specialist in an embassy protection detail in Kabul. While there, he became critical of US American imperialism and began to question his commitments to it. Additionally, he was struck by the gulf between the Muslim antagonist propaganda circulated in the US American media and the Afghan communities he worked closely beside. This led to his enrollment in the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, where he completed a BA in philosophy and religion and anthropology. He went on to complete an MTS in religion, ethics, and politics here at HDS last May. He is currently completing doctoral studies in social and political philosophy at the University of Connecticut, where he studies the thought of Frantz Fanon and W.E.B. Du Bois, philosophy of race, philosophy of education, critical war studies, and just war ethics, and is fleshing out the politics, ethics, tactics, and aesthetics of a phenomenon he terms revolutionary counterviolence. Steve. Well, thank you all so much. It's good to be back at Harvard. Um, uh, I don't really know where to start. This has been an amazing conversation. Um, so I think I'm going to pick up on the conversation of joy. I think the conversation of joy is really, really important. Um, and I think I'm going to kind of juxtapose that to um, an affect that's more near and dear to my heart than joy, which is rage. Um, I think that the two are very, very intertwined, and I think um, for black people and blackness in the United States of America, um, I think they're always in response to the hell that black people are catching. Um, the reality of white supremacy has been <laughs> deeply entrenched in the United States. I don't think we need to, to hit on that. But um, yeah, I think the, the question of joy is really, really important because uh, following in the footsteps of my dear sister, uh, Professor Cherry, who just, I was just listening to her at the, at the, the Harvard Bookstore presenting a book um, on her podcast called Unmute. Uh, one of the ideas that she's really given me that I've walked through the world with since she said it is, uh, she defines joy as bliss in spite of. Uh, and I really, really like this idea because joy is not the same as happiness. Um, if it was, we would just use happiness. I think there's a deep, deep meaning and a deep thing going on whenever we speak of joy. You can only have joy whenever there's something that you shouldn't be joyful of. Um, and in the United States, that happens to be white supremacy, yet black people and non other non-white peoples continue to find a way to say, fuck the white supremacist bullshit. I'm going to be happy for a minute, at least. Um, and I think that that's a really, really important um, role in in the world. Um, now, how that plays out in art, I think, is really, really important. Um, for me, art is a language <clears throat> Um, that can convey truths, perhaps even future truths, 
um, in a language that can't be captured by written or oral or whatever. I think that, that art gives us an emotional truth that can't be conveyed any other way. Um, so for me, my life has very much been defined by hip hop culture. Um, and one of the things that I love about hip hop culture is that it, for me, hip hop is necessarily a critique of, of the social conditions in the United States of America. And I think that's why it's important for me. Um, and I think one of the things that I've been wrestling with in my work over the past few months is thinking about how um, there's sort of a, a generational schism, I think, that's going on within uh, what we might call loosely contoured hip hop culture. Um, and I love that you evoke Brother West and Brother Gordon, uh, two men near and dear to my studies. But um, yeah, I think West and I see, don't see quite eye to eye on, on, the, on his view of hip hop. Um, and I think that there's a generational difference. Um, and I think that we see even a generational difference within hip hop where we like to shape, uh, so-called hip hop heads like to shape uh, the 90s as this golden era of hip hop that is, full of social critique and full of the Nas's and the Jay-Z's and that, but a lot of times we forget that there was also a lot of trash hip hop in the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and we like to elevate and pedestalize a lot of these artists that are, that are great and they should be great, but I don't think, I think we should hold it in tension with some of the shit that came out of the 90s as well. Um, but I think even these hip hop heads, as, as we might call them, um, folks that came up with the culture in the 90s really, really look pejoratively upon what I, I would call trap music, um, which is a necessarily Southern phenomenon, I think, that comes out of Atlanta. Um, but you might hear it called mumble rap. And a lot of the times, um, I think there's a, a different understanding of how we're dealing with these sorts of uh, emotions or affects um, throughout the musical culture. And I think one of those big things is the, is the way that catharsis appears um, in hip hop. Uh, I think that catharsis is really, really, really extremely important. I'm going to read a quote from Du Bois. Um, so Du Bois, for those of the, you that know, um, Du Bois studied what, what we call the sorrow song that comes out of uh, African spiritual as well. Um, du Bois says, quote, through all the sorrow of the sorrow songs, there breathes a hope, a faith in the ultimate justice of things, the minor cadences of despair often to triumph in calm confidence. Sometimes it is a faith in life, sometimes a faith in death, sometimes an assurance of boundless justice in some fair world beyond. But whichever it is, the meaning is always clear, that sometime, somewhere, men will judge men by their souls and not by their skins. So interestingly enough, in that same chapter titled Sorrow Songs, um, Du Bois also says, um, by faithful chance, uh, the Negro folk song, the rhythmic cry of the slave, stands today not simply as the sole American music, but as the most beautiful expression of human experience born on this side of the seas. It has been neglected, and it, and it has been, and is half despised, and, all, and above all, it has been persistently mistaken and misunderstood. But notwithstanding, it still remains as the singular spiritual heritage of the nation and the greatest gift of Negro people. So Du Bois really, really places this heavy, heavy emphasis on the role that uh, African spirituals particularly played on the formation of, of black communities in the United States of America. And as hip hop, I, I view hip hop as uh, a departure from this sorrow song, um, trying to deal with the social and political and economic and otherwise circumstances in the United States of America. And for me, it's that. It's this, this is the role for me, I think, of black art is trying to help us deal with this, whether it is through joy or whether it is through rage, it's to build this effective sort of catharsis that allows us to participate in social society in the United States of America. Um, and I think, interestingly enough, right now in my studies, um, this is very, very new. I just started sort of exploring this line of questioning about catharsis and joy and rage um, in the past few months, but recently I read under Lewis Gordon at UConn, um, Franz Fanon's second dissertation, for those of you that don't know um, who Franz Fanon is, he wrote a book called uh, Black Skin, White Mask, a book called The Wretched of the Earth. But in a dissertation, that <laughs> Black Skin, White Mask was supposed to be his dissertation, but uh, Leon rejected it as his dissertation, so he wrote another dissertation. Um, and in that dissertation, he really, really places catharsis as the key to 
entry into political life, into social and political life. Um, so that's sort of where I'm at um, in my thoughts about art. Like I said, I think that it can, can convey um, really, really power. I think it's powerful and violent. And um, just to wrap up my comments, um, in 1915, uh, D.W. Griffith came out with a, a film called The Birth of a Nation. Um, President at the time, Woodrow Wilson, said something along the lines of, a birth of a nation is history forged by lightning. Um, that was after watching Birth of a Nation in the White House. Well, later on that year, that Thanksgiving, 16 men got together on Stone Mountain, Georgia, and they rebirthed the Klan. Um, fast forward to 1992, um, a man named Bill Clinton rolls out a tough on crime policy from the same exact place where there's now a prison at the base of Stone Mountain, and he rolls out a tough on crime policy in front of a bunch of people. So I think that we're still wrestling with the legacies of, of art that was made in 1915 that still captivates the United States of America. So for me, um, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a, an artist either, but I think all of us need to sort of think that are, that are dealing with the Academy on how for me, it's, it's, it's art, I think, is a medium that, that can express some of these deep ideas at ground levels of, of culture that ac the, the academy just, I don't think, can reach, nor does it want to reach. Um, so yeah, as we think about what it means, art as resistance, particularly from places like Harvard, I think it's important that we think about the legacies and how we can sort of um, um, I guess, challenge some of the negative legacies that have come out of white supremacist art and create new art that can uh, give us a new imagination to imagine a world that is rid of white supremacy as, as difficult as it may seem. Um. <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you so much, Steve. Um, so as we uh, pushing against time, do we have any burning questions for our panelists? <laughs> Sorry? You say burning, I'm not even going to raise my hand. Or just a question, anything, it's fine. Yeah, I would like to. Um, know whether there's some type of, um, there was some type of a video of uh, the Black Joy Project and um, uh, your joy and rage. Hmm. Uh, what I mean, what particularly about joy and rage? Well, I mean, was there um, a, some type of um, program or, you know, um, some Ooh. type of um, carthetic, um, Performance. Um, I'll let you jump on that, and then I'll I'll, I'll jump into to a couple. Of things. Um, well, the Black Joy Project is primarily on the social media platform Instagram, right? So it's a, it's a visual um, representation of Black Joy, and so essentially what he did um, it began with him posting just a picture of he and his mother smiling and enjoying life. And then he wanted to turn that into a larger project, and so he challenged himself to post, continue to post. But he went out um, and, uh, sorry, um, went in the streets and was taking pictures of individuals, was simply asking them the question, what is black joy to you? And then you would hear different individuals uh, giving their response to their conception of black joy, and then those all got posted to Instagram. So that's, if, if you're looking for the Black Joy Project, you would see that, and then you can, I think, find video of him giving an interview about that project. But outside of that, you've seen a number of things that have spun out from that, and other people taking up black joy as a hashtag, and other kinds of artistic uh, production. So you can find video of Mark Bamuti Joseph's Black Joy in the Hour of Chaos and that performance that he did in New York. You can find uh, his poem around that. You can find Asia uh, Monet, a, a poet, plus a poem on Black Joy. You can find um, Javon Johnson, who is a professor and performance artist who has a piece on Black Joy and a number of folks who, who have done this. Um, the Collegium of Africana African Diaspora Dance, CAD, um, that's operated out of Duke by Professor Tommy DeFrance. Um, their biennial conference on Africana dance was Dancing Black Joy last year. 
And so they have a, a number of dance theorists, performance artists, theater folks who are theorizing their uh, way of talking about black joy and its embodiment. Um, and I think there's video footage of, of parts of that conference. So there, I think there are different ways that you could, you could access um, manifestations of uh, popular cultural expressions of black joy. Uh, as for the rage part, um, I, I would just recommend generally, uh, I'm with Du Bois. I think black music is like the greatest thing that's ever come out of the United States of America. And I think that continues today. And I think one of the, the shortcomings of the way that we talk about the hip hop culture and the hip hop industry is that we focus on albums and streams and rather than full corpuses of projects. So I would recommend that you look at these music videos, these short films that these artists are sort of putting together. Uh, here I'm thinking, um, like uh, Kanye West and Jay-Z's No Church in the Wild is, is a crazy, crazy rendition of Revolution. Um, there's a number of, of artists that, that have really, really high quality visual art that comes along with their, um, uh, with their, their lyrics and, and their musical art. Uh, Jay-Z, his 444 album, he put out a different film for every single track that's on that that explores a different facet of some social ill in the United States. Um, but yeah, for me, I think rage is really, really encapsulated in, in a lot of particularly uh, what you might might think of more as even rap than hip hop. So uh, listen to any Meek Mill intro introduction on any Meek Mill album and you will feel what the fuck they're talking about with rage because it's it's pretty intense but um yeah i would just say keep an eye out for um i, I would say look for artists that you enjoy like for me particularly i'll watch any any film that j cole puts out any film that jay-z puts out any film that travis scott puts out there's a number of of different artists i think that are coming up that focus a little bit even more as great as their music is they focus on the visuals of of what comes along with that music and what they want to portray to to uh, watchers um, that may not even experience it as much as the music, so. And if you're looking to <clears throat> even out the testosterone a little bit, Janelle yeah. <laughs> Monet. Uh, Janelle Monet has a video for her song Django Jane and also released an entire album, an entire motion picture for her album, uh, Dirty Computer, and Janelle Monet is a queer black woman for those that know. And so I would also recommend that as some visual to engage with. And let's not forget about Queen B. Of course, <laughs> lemonade. <laughs> a lemon. Yes. So I, I'm just thinking, I'm saying, how do we tr translate that to resistance and structural change? You know, in terms of um, you know using it because we have a lot of these artists who are sort of doing these things, but how is that pushing us to create the kind of um, structure of the resistance? You know, mass resistance and, and structural change that's going to um, alter, you know, a lot of the causes of this. Hi, Baba. Uh, can I answer your question? <laughs> um, so I think that that's a really I think that's a really good question even in even in the framing of um, mass resistance right I think that oftentimes we think about our movement as like the organizing the mass resistance and the direct action which naturally tend to be really uh, masculine types of work and when I say masculine I don't mean men I mean like masculine kind of linear energy um, and we don't think as we don't think of the more feminine emotional work. Um, that typically comes from cultural organizing, that typically comes from artists, that typically comes from women as also being a part of that resistance. And so when I envision the way that this kind of revolutionary art is really gonna get us there is by marrying those two things together. I think that what's, what, what we're, there's something that we're not connecting in the movement right now about the necessity of having those two things together. And I feel like that's why it feels like we're kind of doing this start and stop, it's because we're not connecting this other part of it. And so I think that really the role of the art but is, is to be transformative, right? I think that you, you can theorize art, but at, at the end of the day, it's something that needs to move you. It's something that you need to feel in your body. Um, and when I think about particularly the estuary projects, and I think about the state of the world right now, is that this, this constant bombardment bar, bar of like this pain, but also this kind of like push that we have to do more and work harder and, and kind of like respond and show out in mass all of the time stops us from taking the actual time that we need to slow, right? And, and I'm thinking about what are the really, my hope is that the art can, 
can get us to really think about what are the small, tiny, intentional things that we can do that are gonna move us closer to where we're trying to go every day. Um, I'm not saying that those things, that, that the kind of work that we're doing now in the movement doesn't need to exist, but I think that we need to do a mu we need to have a much more concerted effort of bringing those things together because I think that that's actually what's gonna give us the, the drive. I think that's actually what's gonna push the work over. So with your particular work, for example, you know, based on the women who were murdered. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I was part of that process when we were organizing. Yep. And 2,000 women, you know, people, not just women, but women led it, yep. you know, to deal with that. And so that was in like 79, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and so forth with the film. I don't know if you know about the film. Yeah, yeah, but on April 1st. They, they, they take the walk on April 1st. People united. Yep. By lines of state. Mm -hmm. But the question is that, so that's in 79. Yes. And so your installation is addressing that now. But now we have, uh, what's her name, Jazzy Correa, Jazzy Correa yeah. and other stuff, you know. So how do we, you know, we have to really look at uh, uh, art mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. relationship to change, but in relationship to movement mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. And how do we begin to make that, you know, that connection? Yeah. And, you know, and examine the Black Rights Movement and what they do right and what are some of the errors and how we move forward. Mm -hmm. It's a very important part. Yes. Yeah. We'll keep making installations and still be enslaved. And I think that the purpose of the project is exactly what you're saying. It's to remember that things are cyclical, mm -hmm. right? And so this Jazzy Correa thing <coughs> has happened smack in the middle of remembering these women yes. in the 40th anniversary. And the framing of the Estuary Projects is that 2019 is a lot like 1979, right? And so my hope is that by remembering that we've already been here, that we've done this before, and that we've seen these things before, it's going to embolden us, our people, um, to like build this audacity to imagine, right? What I'm trying to do is use art to, to embolden people to feel that we have everything that we need to move forward instead of feeling like we need to go and strategize again and have another march and do another rally and show up to this thing, right? I think that culture is upstream from structure and system. And so how are we building through art culture, right, that's gonna shift? Because that's really what we're trying to do. We're gonna just, like you said, we're gonna keep doing the same thing over and over again unless something shifts. Um, and so when we're looking at it, what is it that needs to shift, right? What are we doing? Um, what are we doing that's the same? Um, and what do we need to do that's different? Just quickly, quickly I, I mean, I would want to, because I, I think we often get into these conversations about um, culture versus politics, right? And to like, what's, what's the real thing? Is, it, is it culture really politics or is cultural work really significantly political? And I, I think to me, that's, that's kind of an argument that doesn't, doesn't get us very far. Um, if I think about the, the Black Joy Project, um, it's coming, it, it emerges from an organizer who cannot get out of the bed anymore because the work has become so de de dispiriting and debilitating. I can't move, I can't get up because I've seen this happen over and over again. So how do I exercise self-care and healing for myself to get me back into the work, right? So the art becomes that, that means to get me back into the work. And it is, he's receiving messages from other organizers who said, I was burnt out too, but I came across your, your page and now I'm renewed back for the work on the one hand, so that the art becomes a means to replug into the work. But on the other hand, I wanna say that on another level, I think black joy is the end game. You do the political work, because you don't have joy. you want joy. Like I don't want politics. I want joy. And I want some of that joy right now, even as I'm doing the political work to get to joy, so that I don't have to keep struggling and organizing and fighting so that I can just be and have the joy that was already my as my birthright. Right? So so I think that the question of well how does something like art push us back to politics is one question, but how does politics push us to the kind of affect I think that, that we want from the art is, is another way to, to, to get at the question. Yes. Oh, do you have a question as well? Okay, I'll go to um, Nikki and then I'll come back to you. Thank you.
is the ethical project of production that is in the face of death. So if it is over and over a process of creating and working and believing in newness that comes from the imaginative space of um, you know, sort of another possibility, then it's a way of creating habits and a way of creating life um, over and over again through productivity that contrasts the work of death dealing, um, you know, oppressive <coughs> politics, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think in that way it becomes really valuable. So I think I heard that from what you're saying, and um, I read it as an ethic so that art becomes a barometer for mm -hmm. action, becomes a, a measurement for how we are to be and behave as human beings in relation. And to echo that, sometimes it just allows us to be right like art for me like i think one of the problems is that sometimes art the art of the art is actually just like that's what i like about trap music i think a lot of the art that's in trap music that people miss is like i actually just want to exist right now i don't want to fucking think about the politics i don't want to think about anything i want to drink some lean and exist in a way that feels good um, and I think that that's an important part of the politics is having that little piece of respite, even if it's only for a song. I, I, I want to say one more thing. I think I think we also have to be very strategic. Coming from an, an artist's perspective, you have to value the artist so much because I think when the artist is liberated, the movement moves forward. Mm -hmm. Because if the artist is bound, you won't actually get the prophecy because it's literally out of the soul of the artist that the movement moves because they paint the picture of what the future will look like. But if you bind me and my artistic creation and don't value who I am and allow me to express what I feel as an artist, we won't get anywhere. <clears throat> and so I think movements politically have to be conscious of saving the artists, keeping them liberated so that they can keep producing the art that's needed to push us to the next level. Yeah. Wonderful, Zumbi. No, you're fine. Okay, so so um, basically two weeks ago, um, some of us were here, where you are, and we were speaking in front of religions, our divinity school, religions and the practice of peace. Mm -hmm. And there was a notion of that conversation, which was, but we're having a conversation here at Harvard Divinity School. And uh, there's, a, there's a number of people we were talking about, like I'm, I know something and I'm gonna talk to you about that as you're believe, that implies that somebody's life is gonna be better because of what I know. Mm -hmm. But one question is like, how do we know we actually have it right? And, and at, one, at one point, like somebody's life is better or not because of what we're saying. And um, I think Baba was kind of testing T Kendra on another identity she has. So we have a, um, um, a population identity, just we have Boston is set up. Some of us are like this woman that people are reading about in the news and tweeting about because she was kidnapped. We're gonna be with that family in that neighborhood. And we're gonna use some notion of what we're talking about here to make that community better or not. And, um, and I've been trying to find what I thought, what, what medicine sometimes called the vertical line from what's happening in academia to being actually happening on the ground. Sure. Not, not in silo pieces. Yeah. And in that thinking, I'm just gonna share a couple things because I have fear for the first time. One, um, I think when we start talking about certain English words, we're using words that Africans invented concepts for that English can't capture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like the word joy design, no, I don't, I don't think captures what we're talking about. I think I've seen an instance of this rage and joy thing combined. Um, two, Saturday ago, two Saturdays ago, we had 65 crumpers in the room doing psychodrama yeah. about hyper-violence yeah. mm -hmm. with this joy at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that to me is uniquely an African yeah. concept. Mm -hmm. uh, earlier, this person talked about how great I was. <coughs> so, uh, that's joy and kind of <coughs> all that place. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes, in, uh, I do a lot of arts work, you know, hundreds of parties, you know, film and all of that. But when I'm in that identity as artist, I gotta figure out another word for this other thing, which is mm -hmm. art that derived from the way Africans invented the notion of art. Like mm -hmm. the first time an African said, oh, Baba can have a view of me that's separate than my own view of myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna put something on my body or make a sound to communicate something different to him. And we're gonna communicate, uh, communicate on those lines. That's what I call art, the, the beginning of art. And um, that was transmitting my soul though. Transmitting my soul, it wasn't too entertaining. So I've been trying to separate entertainment from art. Yeah. And here's where my fear is. This is the highest time since, uh, I'm just gonna talk about black people for it, um, in black existence that so many black people don't consider themselves artists. Like it goes down exponentially. Yeah. I can't sing because I'm not good. Whereas it was invented for the expression yeah. of your soul. And now we're, 
There's some art forms where like, because of your body type, you can't do this. Right? And somebody's judging how well you sing, so you don't get the expression of like, my grandmother just died and I wanna sing, and better not nobody tell me that sound terrible. Yeah. That's against our wire. Um, and then it's the first time, this is the three first times, the first time ever since so many black people are exiting the church, whatever church we're talking about, is a huge exodus as like, 20, 12 to 45 years old, not following any practice, is, is sharply, sharply increasing since, so it's say it increased, the, the growth rate declined, but now we have a decline. Mm -hmm. And then the suicide rate of black people. Now somehow, yeah, I don't have any answer. Well, I mean, I have a couple things I'm toying with, but somehow, I, you know, after a conference like this, we'll all disperse, but how do we all stay together so we can work on this extremely hard problem, yeah. which will require tweaking of whatever we said, yeah. that says, yes, that suicide rate will go down, Faith will be increased, and the use of whatever we get the joy of doing is now going to spread to the average person in Fulton County District. And I was just this last piece is about the healing of the artist and joy of being that thing. Kendra and I were in, well, she called me down to South Carolina, Ferguson, Louis, um, to deal with Ferguson. I'm talking about Tef Poe, all those guys. And that stress of organizing, there was no container for. I don't think celebrating alone does it. And there's a, a science of taking care of people that are exposed that you probably are very familiar with, uh, being deployed, like critical incident, stress debriefing, and so forth. And basically, that's what we offer the organizers. Yes, there was joy in that too, but the, the caretaking of the warrior, in a sense, I think we need to make science on that. Uh, because there is a way to pull someone back together. Firemen get it all the time, EMTs. We need to do something to, so wherever, again, like, that's what I'm talking. I'm scared about all those things. And, Panels to me are a great time to be together, and then we'll be hoping that we stay connected in the conversation we'll see afterwards. And that separation is going to somehow undo. Maybe you can give us uh, thank you so much for your comments and for all of your insights. And there is a point that I that I, I do want to insert, and I think for peoples of African descent, um, art has isn't is embodied and has always been a part of our resistance. And we have to remember that in the day-to-day, -day, from the days of the, 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 the ring shouts to um, the juke joints to the ways in which we use music. The juke joints, um, blues has emerged, uh, the spirituals have emerged fashioning ourselves through artistic aesthetic. And I'm talking about day-to-day -day ways in which black folk have always resisted through the arts, through the aesthetics of the body, right? Black um, fashioning, um, black bodies, black women's modes of fashioning. One of the things I've noticed um, in social movements now is the ways that artistic aesthetics and, and deployment is woven into our movement from BLMLA where women who were um, shutting down a major LA thoroughfare highway and um, did so nude from the top up, down with um, art on their bodies, right? Disrupting a, a mechanistic system that chooses to erase not just black bodies, but black lives, right? And I remember in Ferguson, shortly after the uprisings, the first um, period of, of uh, uprisings there, that organizers disrupted the symphony by infiltrating a performance at the symphony that was Lily White and it's as such as symphonies go, uh, right, where you have the separation of class and those who have the privilege of, of being sequestered and enjoying or, or consuming um, certain kinds of music, organizers disrupted the performances and dropped banners. And cosmically for us, that is significant and it signifies and it disrupts the status quo. I'm, I'm totally in agreement that this is one way to enact resistance. This is one way to also um, uh, 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 cast imaginaries of black life and to feed and nurture the souls of black folk within the systems and structures in which we exist. Art is a part of our 
our movement, art is a part of our daily lives. So I'm concerned about binaries, where we separate the, the political from, from, from the artistic or the spiritual even. I think of um, the, the tradition of the black church, and I think this is woven into Africa, Africana spiritualities throughout, where the full humanity and expression and range and ledgers and registers of emotion and are, are intertwined, they're interconnected. Um, I don't think we are of this business of dissecting and compartmentalizing our humanity. Um, and so I, I, I think perhaps it's, 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 it's continuing to revisit and reimagining and reconstructing what we mean when we say art. Um, and there are particular modes and, 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 and uses and lineages of art um, that revolutionaries, including Simone, including um, uh, Paul, uh, is it Paul Robeson? Um, that who and and you know artists today who currently deploy their art. Tef Poe is one. Um, Azra Monet, and I'm going to close us out on that note. But um, I know that every time we gather, we de we deploy art because it is a way of life, um, representing our full humanity um, within our existential reality. So with that, you uh, conjured Azra Monet. Bakier. Um, this uh, piece was done at the Say in uh, Say Her Name March, and um, yeah, I will close us out right after this. I am a woman carrying other women in my mouth. Behold a sister, a daughter, a mother, dear friend, spirits demystified on my tongue. They gather to breathe and exhale, a dance with death we know is not the end. All these nameless bodies haunted by pellet wounds in their chest, listen for them in the saying of a name you cannot pronounce. Black and woman is a sort of magic you cannot hashtag. The mere weight of it, too vast to be held, we hold ourselves. An inheritance felt between the hips, womb of soft darkness, portal of light. Watch them envy the revolution of our movement. How we break open to give life flow by the terror of our tears, the torment of our taste. My rage is righteous. My love is righteous. My name be righteous. Hear what I am not here to say. We too have died. We know we are dying too. I am not here to say, look at me, how I died so brutal a death. I deserve a name to fit all the horror in. I am here to tell you how if they mention me in their protests and their rallies, they would have to face their role in it too. My beauty too. I have died many times before the blow of the body. I have bled many months before the bullet to the flesh. We know, women know, the body is not the end. Call it what you will, but for all the handcuffed wrists of us, the shackled ankles of us, the bend over to make room for us, how dare we speak anything less than I love you. We who love just as loudly in the thunderous rain as when the sun shines golden on our skin. The world kisses us unapologetically. We be so beautiful when we be. How are you going to be free without me? Your freedom is tied up in mine at the nappy edge soul of my singing for all my sisters. Watch them stretch their arms in my voice. How they fly open chested toward your ears. Listen, watch them stretch their arms in my voice how they fly, open chested toward your ear. Listen for Rakia Boyd, Tanisha Anderson, Yvette Smith, Ayanna Jones, Kayla Moore, Shelly Frey, Miriam Carey, Kendra James, Alberta School, Tarika Wilson, Cherise Francis, Chantel Davis, Melissa Williams, Darnisha Harris, Michelle Cousseau, Pearly Golden, Katherine Johnson, Eleanor Bumpers, Natasha McKenna, Shanika Proctor. Listen, listen, watch my sister stretch their arms in my voice, how they fly, open chested toward your ear. We will not vanish. We will not vanish in the bated breath of our brothers. Show me, show me a man willing to fight beside me. My hand in his, the color of courage. Show me, 
Show me a man willing to fight beside me. My hand in his, the color of courage. There is no mountaintop worth seeing without us. Meet me in the trenches where we lay our bodies down in the valley of a voice. Say, say it. Say it, y'all. Say her name.